الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وسيدنا وحبيبنا محمد على آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما يا رب العالمين اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته You know, these days, one of the things that we've been talking about a lot is the topic or the issue of social justice. Justice on a societal level. As a society, are we just? And alhamdulillah, I believe that we as Muslims, if not, if we are, we're at least trying to be on the forefront of the fight for social justice. However, with that being said, one of the issues that we are going through today is the issue of justice on a personal level. What I mean by that is, if we're calling for social justice, if we're calling for a just society, can we really do that if in our personal lives we aren't really just? Can we really do that if in our personal interaction, we may not be just? Can we really do that if in our relationships, we aren't really just? You know, to criticize other people, to say, you know, society is messed up. Those people are messed up. Sometimes that's just more convenient. Sometimes it's easier, ironically, to look at the bigger problem and think that that is more solvable because to look at yourself seems far more complicated. It seems far more difficult. It seems like something that, you know, maybe I can't accomplish that. And that is why sometimes we run away from our problems to a cause. We run away to things like social justice instead of looking at the justice of ourselves. Are we as an individual, are we as a human being, are we as a Muslim, a just Muslim, are we a just human being? And that is why we look at the life of the Prophets والسلام, and we find that they embodied justice on a personal level and then, yes, also on a societal level. They were able to call for justice in society because they themselves as individuals were just. They were known to be just. The Prophet وسلم, himself, he was known well before the message of Islam came to him, well before he received a revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the people of Mecca knew who the Prophet was sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Can we say that about ourselves? Can we say that in the society that we are living in, that when people think about Muslims, they say, yes, these people are just. In my interaction with the Muslim, I saw that they were just with me. I saw that they treated me fairly. I saw that they had patience with me. I saw that they overlooked my flaws. Can we say that about ourselves? And so once again, we look at the lives of the prophets. Amongst them, Yusuf alayhi salam. Now Yusuf alayhi salam, like all of the other prophets, was an example for us. And actually the story of Yusuf alayhi salam is one of the most detailed stories we have in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about Yusuf alayhi salam, لَقَدْ كَانَ فِي Yusuf, Most certainly in Yusuf, وَإِخْوَتِهِ And his brothers, there's signs, there's a sign, آيَاتٌ لِلسَّائِلِينَ There are signs for those who ask. Meaning you want an example of how to embody justice how to live a just life, then look at what happened between Yusuf alayhi salam and his brothers. Look at the life of Yusuf alayhi salam. And what's amazing about the life of Yusuf alayhi salam and the story of Yusuf alayhi salam, which I, I would imagine most people have heard this story, right? We learn this story as kids from a very basic level. We, 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 we learn this story. And if you look at the life of Yusuf alayhi salam, 
Yusuf السلام, was wronged every step of the way in his journey. Every step of the way in the story of Yusuf, we find him being wronged to the point where if you come across the story of Yusuf السلام, for the first time in your life, you look at how he went from one situation to another situation to another situation, and you say to yourself, no way, it's not possible. We would say, that's just some extreme bad luck, right? You look at the major plot points of the story of Yusuf السلام, every single one until we get to the end. Every single one is him being wronged, alayhi salatu wasalam. We start off with the brothers of Yusuf السلام, plotting to murder him. Uqtulu Yusuf, kill him. Is there a more treacherous plot than to murder someone? To murder your own brother? Out of jealousy? That's what happened. That's the first major plot point in the story of Yusuf السلام, and it's the murder of Yusuf. But they resort to not murdering him. What do they do? They want to exile him. So what do they decide? They decide to take him out of the city and throw him in the well. And you know what's interesting about that, subhanAllah? That when they plotted that part of their relationship with Yusuf السلام, they went and sought permission from the father of Yusuf السلام, Yaqub السلام, who loved Yusuf السلام, dearly. And they ask him, they ask his permission if they can take him. And what does Ya'qub say? He says, no, I fear that if you're not paying attention, a wolf is going to come eat him. And how do they respond to him? They say, a wolf? We're a strong clan. We are, we are, there's, a, there's 11 of us. There's 10 of us. There's, we're, we're, we're a large number of people. How can a wolf come? We will, we will never allow that to happen. And then they take Yusuf السلام, out and they throw him at the bottom of the well. Right? What do they say? Al-Quhu fi ghayabat al Throw him in the lowest part of the well. The very bottom of the well. And then they come back to their father. And what do they say to Yaqub السلام? They say, you know, we weren't paying attention and a wolf ate him. And you would think, subhanAllah, as someone listening to this story, you would say, really? Like, that just seemed like a really flimsy excuse, right? Because he, he already said, like, I fear a wolf is going to eat him, and they respond, yeah, you know what, a wolf ate him. But you know what the scholars say about this? That the brothers of Yusuf, alayhi salam, they knew that, you, you, that Yaqub, alayhi salam, the father of Yusuf, alayhi salam, was already thinking. He was already, he already had that fear of a wolf eating Yusuf السلام, so they're like, you know what, if we go with that, then that'll seem very probable to Yaqub السلام. And there's more of a chance that they will believe, that he will believe them. And so they come back and they tell Yusuf السلام, that he's eaten by a wolf. Plot point, wronged. What happens next? He's sold into slavery. Now you can imagine, subhanAllah, the life that Yusuf السلام, lives. Going from the bottom of the well, being in a state of uncertainty, darkness, not just, you know, some part of the well. They didn't say, let's put him, they said, throw him at the bottom of the well to increase, subhanAllah, that would only increase somebody in despair. He goes from there to be sold into slavery. He goes from there to, you know, we think maybe his situation is going to get better. It's getting better because he is serving Al-Aziz, a very powerful man, and they're going to treat him right. But what happens? The wife of Al-Aziz, she tries to seduce him unsuccessfully. She tries to seduce him, and then when that doesn't work, she blames him. And because of that, he goes to prison. Once again, Yusuf السلام, being wronged. In prison, there's a glimmer of hope. He meets two young men, and he knows that they'll be getting out at some point. And they ask for his help, he helps them, and the only thing he asks from them is for them to mention him to the ruler. Just mention, just mention who I am, mention what I'm able to do, mention that I'm able to interpret visions and dreams. But what happens? 
They forget. And once again, like I said, you look at the story of Yusuf Salam, and you're like, no way. How is that possible? Like every step of the way, just where it could go wrong, it went wrong. Every place that, that something bad could have happened or seemingly bad could have happened, it does. They forget. They just forgot. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells he just stayed in prison for a number of years. Can you imagine being left in prison? And you know what, subhanAllah? The brothers of Yusuf alayhi salam, they have forgotten about him. They're like, we're done with him. Yaqub alayhi salam doesn't know. He is uncertain. From the perspective of Yusuf alayhi salam, there is nobody in the world who cares about him. Except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No one in the world who cares about him. And now he came across two people that would have brought him some hope. And even they forget. They just forget to mention him. And now he's sitting in prison feeling like there's no one out there. Now I bring up this point because I really want you to feel what that would be like. Just sitting in prison for years and years and years. That was the life of Yusuf alayhi salam until the end. We'll get to the end. How would you react if you were to be able to meet the people who wronged you? How would we react in a situation where we get to face the people who have caused all the problems in our life? What would we do? Well, we'd probably want revenge. We'd probably want to get back at them. And that's why one of the lessons we learn from the story of Yusuf السلام, is how he remained just even when in the end Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him victory. Not only is he freed from slavery, not only is he freed from prison, he becomes one of the main ministers of the king. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grants him a lofty position. That was the reward of his trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That was the reward of understanding the bigger picture. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reminds us of this as believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Inna lil muttaqina mafaza. For those who have taqwa, for those who are conscious of Allah, there is success. How many times in the Quran does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala remind us, Wal aqibatu lil muttaqin? And the good outcome, the successful outcome is for those who have taqwa. Yet we're caught up in these petty cases of revenge. You know, he said this about me, I got to say this about them. This person wronged me, they did this to me, I got to do this to them. And you want to know like the simplest, plainest, clearest example of this? Just ask yourself how you behave or how we behave when somebody wrongs us on the road, when somebody cuts us off, or somebody drives in a way that we don't like, that is a testimony to our character. That is a testimony to our sense of justice. Because you know what? We always feel like we're right when we're in the car. You know, as one person said, that if somebody's driving faster than you, then they're a maniac. If somebody's driving slower than you, then they're a dummy. Right? Somebody zooms past you, you're like, look at this. Look at this crazy guy. He's going to kill somebody. Right? Too fast. This is insane. Like, now you're driving fast and somebody's going slower than you. You're like, oh, look at this idiot. He's got nowhere to be today. Right? Probably doesn't have a job. Probably has nothing to do in life. Nothing's going on. I got nowhere to go. Right? We always feel wronged on the road. Well, there's hundreds and thousands of other drivers. They all feel the same way. And our sense of justice kicks in on the road. Right? How dare this person do such and such to me? And our character begins to reveal itself. Our personal sense of justice begins to reveal itself. That's personal justice. That's a, the that's a, that's a justice on, our, on an individual level. And that's why if you want to know the true character of someone, then there's two parties who will really, really be able to tell you what the true character of an individual is. Number one, your spouse. And number two, your children. We can pretend to be whatever we want in public. We can go to the masjid and be like the nicest, kindest person ever. We can be in the grocery store and here and there and be nice to the whole world. But you're not fooling your spouse. 
she or he sees the day to day. Your children, our children, you know what they are? They're silent observers at times, especially when they're young. They may not react to what we do. They may not say, hey, dad, hey, mom, that's wrong or whatever, but they see it. Our children know our true character. Our children know what happens when we go through a difficulty. What happens when we go through a hardship? And that is why the Prophet ﷺ reminded us of what our behavior should be when we feel wronged. When we go through a difficulty. True patience is at the onset of a calamity. Patience is, is as if you know the way the Prophet ﷺ worded this hadith, it's as if patience is only at the onset of a calamity. Because later on, yeah, we can, we can act like we're a patient person. And I often say some people are really, some people are just delusional about their sense of patience, right? Like they'll flip out or whatever, get mad, yell, all this kind of stuff. But if you speak to this person, they'd be like, yeah, I'm, I'm a pretty, person, pretty, pretty patient guy, right? I'm a pretty patient woman. I think I'm, I'm pretty good. I have control over my nuffs. Be like, really? You just flipped out on, on, on the road. You just flick somebody off as a Muslim, right? You think nobody saw it, but I saw it, right? On the onset of a calamity, at the onset of a calamity, that is what our true character is. And it is in moments like that that we find Yusuf alayhi salam maintaining onto his morals and his ideals as a Muslim, as a believer. And you know, the father of Yaqub alayhi salam, he knew this as well. Because this is a characteristic that was found in him, Yusuf alayhi salam, and his father. And that is why when Yusuf alayhi salam is taken away from Yaqub alayhi salam, when another son is taken away from Yaqub alayhi salam, one of the things that Yaqub alayhi salam, he says is, فَصَبْرٌ جميل. He says, patience is beautiful. He calls the beautiful, beautiful patience. What is beautiful patience? Like I said, some of us were delusional about our sense of patience. But you know what this beautiful patience is? Imam Ibn Kathir, ta'ala, in his tafsir of this ayah, he says, beautiful patience. He called patience beautiful because there is something that Ya'qub alayhi salam knew. Inni a'lamu min Allahi ma la ta'lamun. I know from Allah that which you don't know. What did he know? He, know, he knew to only expect goodness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Sooner or later. And that is what gives us our sense of justice. That is what gives us the ability to be patient. Knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as we see in Surah Yusuf, إِنَّهُ هُوَ الْعَلِيمُ الْحَكِيمُ Allah is the one, He is the most knowledgeable. The, he has all, he is all knowing. Not only that, he is all wise. And that means that nothing, nothing happens except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows about it. Nothing happens except that a person will have to answer for the injustice that they did. So maybe in this life we are wronged. Maybe in this life someone did something to us. A Muslim, a believer knows that if they are conscious of Allah, if they hold on to their piety, if they hold on to their sense of justice, if they are patient, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will take care of everything. Maybe in this life or maybe not. But at least in the afterlife, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the ultimate judge. Allah will give everyone what they deserve. And that is why, my brothers and sisters, there is a day of judgment. That's one of the wisdoms of a day of judgment. You know, sometimes we look at the day of judgment as a negative thing. That's the day when, you know, khras, we're all have to, we're gonna have to answer for everything. But have you thought about the other side of that equation? That anyone who has wronged you, anyone who has harmed you in any way, that they will have to answer on that day. And they're not gonna have to answer to just any judge. They're going to answer to a judge who knows every single thing that happened. There is no one on earth like that. There is no human being who knows everything, all of the facts of every situation. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Al-Alim, knows. 
He knows everything. So there can be no one more just than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he is Al-Hakim. He is the most wise. Meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no bias. Can we say that about human beings? Can you say that about any human being? Is there any one of us that can say, yeah, I have no biases? Right? Somebody comes to me for advice or this and that. We all have some type of bias, whether we admit to it or not. And it factors in on in how we view things, what we say, what type of judgments we make between people. Sometimes someone comes to us with a dispute, an argument, and we take sides or not take sides. And all our bias factors into that. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no bias. There is no one more fair than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as a believer, we take solace in that. As a believer, when someone wrongs us, when we're going through these challenges, and yes, we're going through challenges without a doubt. We've heard this, we know this, we're living this. But we never want to cross the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We never want to treat someone unjustly because we have felt wrong, because we know that if we are patient, that if we do nothing but leave matters in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is not what I'm saying, I'm saying we should be just, but we err on the side of caution. We don't want to cross the limits of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't want to cross the limits of justice. If we are going to preach justice, we have to live a just life. And that is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when describing this ummah, when describing you, O Muslim, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطًا And thus, we have made you the wasat nation, the wasat people, the most balanced people, the most just people. So that you may be a witness over mankind. But we cannot be witnesses over mankind if we don't have that justice. The moment we are no longer just, we don't have sure footing. What can we say to others when we ourselves are not just? And so my, my message, my brothers and sisters, is to look within yourself. Yes, fighting for social justice is a good cause. And yes, alhamdulillah, we're involved in that. And the plight of others affects us. And it bothers us when we see other people being wronged, of course. When we see someone being treated unjustly, on a societal level, it should shake us to the core. But don't forget about yourself. Because first and foremost, you're going to have to answer about your nafs on the day of judgment. Nafsi, nafsi. People are going to say, myself, myself on the day of judgment. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us truly this wasat nation, this moderate, balanced, and just nation. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us the means of peace and goodness wherever we may be. Ameen. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. Wa jazakumullahu khaira. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.